This is where it begins. A gateway to North Korea. Okay, so if we wander this way. You can't just walk in with a camera, so we'll get a bit of a briefing today from Nick, who's going to tell us a lot of what we can do, what we can't do, what we can bring, what we can't bring, what we can say, what we can't say while we're there. Koreans prefer their country to be called DPRK, that's the official name of the country, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, so if you can say that, they appreciate it. You're going to be with two guides at all times. You're never alone. <laughs> you're, right. you're always with your with your guides. I mean, people often say, you say "Well, you know, their their mind is to this and the other." The fact is, in the end, that's their job is guiding. They basically deliver um, the facts and figures, and it's a it's a great tool for facts and figures, as you will find out. We've all got our preconceptions of what Korea is about. Likewise, they have their point of view. When you start understanding their mentality, you start seeing their perspective of where they're coming from and why they are. So, photography, no pictures from the coach. You, you basically don't know what you're photographing. You could be going past military installations. You're gonna get a very wobbly uh, picture anyhow. No sneak pictures, no pictures of the military, no pictures of the public without their permission. Having your feet up like that would be really rude. The big statue of Kim Il-sung. When you're taking a photograph, it's the whole thing. You don't just cut it in half. That would be very offensive. You're wandering around, I love that. Basically, there is no wandering around. It is a group tour, and you stay with your guides outside the hotel. In your free time, yeah, you can roam the island, but do not leave it. I love it. So we're we staying on an island? Yeah, the island is a great place to be, and it's central sort of to the whole area. Is there an obvious reason for putting all the tourists on an island? I think that's actually after the, the idea. They certainly didn't build a hotel with the idea of that. And I think later it's quite handy to have a place where you know where your tourists are. There you go. Are the rooms bugged? Room is not bugged, probably not, but be careful anyway. Um, you know, there, there are such things as bug rooms. They're not interested in you, even if there were. They really, I don't think, sad to say, you've got a lot to say. Um, is this room bugged right now? <laughs> um, yeah, and then off record a couple of things, if I may, just yeah. whack it off. Uh, visas, here you go. For the first time ever, we're not in control, and that's a tough adjustment to make. The fact that you've got to adjust and play by different rules. It's going to be difficult over the next seven days to keep the open mind, or well, to give this place the respect it deserves because it is so different. Operation not go to jail. So we have a list of things you can't wear, things you're not allowed to bring in. I got my bed here cleared out and I'm gonna put all the stuff I think I can't bring. And then Scott has his. We did know ahead of time that we were gonna have to dress appropriately for certain things. So for the first time ever, we've actually got some somewhat fancy clothes. In fact, I even have a tie. I can't wear that, can I? Not offensive, but not appropriate. Things I can't bring. Cell phone? No cell phone, right? Since you got dressed up, guess what I brought? Hey. I'm ready for North Korea. It's not offensive. But look at how cute he is. You heard how careful you have to be and to not be disrespectful at certain things. It's not being disrespectful. I, but will they understand? But if I was playing with kids, say if I was playing with kids and I put it on, they that'd be cool, because I'm just playing with the kids, right? Maybe. 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 What do you have that you can't wear? I don't know. It's probably not appropriate to bring military pattern. Close down. Something else that's a first for us is bringing this little guy. That's just in case we need it. Okay. Go for it. So now we got one of these little cameras here. Swap it. Just in case uh, our guides think that this camera here is uh, a little too big and uh, this one's a little more appropriate. Looks awful. Thanks! <laughs> hey, this thing is official. It says here made in China, so I know it's the real deal. <laughs> Alright boys, next stop, Pyongyang. And it feels good to be going in an appropriate dress. <laughs> We're at the gate, and uh, in less than an hour we'll be airborne. That's a ticket stub that I won't soon let go of. Beijing, Pyongyang. 
we're very lucky and we're very privileged to have that chance to go there and be there. It's really lucky. They've uh, they started boarding. Here we go. Hopefully, I'll see you on the other side, Andre. It's so roomy in here. <laughs> Isn't it? Oh, yeah. Less than a few thousand outsiders per year actually get to enter North Korea. And even that's only started in the last decade. It's kind of scary. We're all kind of uncertain what we're going to see, what we're allowed to see. You got to watch what you say. You got to watch what you do. You get nervous sometimes because you're just not sure how accepted you're going to be when you go there. It looks so much different than Beijing. <laughs> it's probably going to be a lot of fresh air here. So this is our bus. It's a big bus for just a couple of guys. I'm Justin. Yes, I'm Tech. Check. Mm -hmm. Check. Kim. Kim. Uh, nice Kim? To meet you. Scott. Scott. Andre. Nice Andre. Oh, okay, let's meet you. Andre. Mm -hmm. I imagine you're very informed. You know everything about North Korea. Yeah. DPRK. DPRK. For the guides, they seem a bit intimidated with us and the camera. And there's a certain amount of intimidation that we're already up against. The very first thing that you do when you enter North Korea is pay respect to Kim Il Sung. Although he passed away in 1994, he remains the president of DPRK. For you on camera, um, very important to keep the whole statue uh, in shot. Walking up this big grand statue, they're telling you what you should do, and we need to walk in unison, and we're supposed to stop at a certain point, and we're supposed to bow, and you do get nervous because it's a place where you don't want to screw up, and you really want to be respectful. Get the guy to be a little bit shy right now. A little bit shy. Me, a little bit timid. Do you want to properly reintroduce yourselves? I am Che Ong Nim, and you can simply call me Che. Kim Won Ik. Thank you so much for welcoming us in. We look forward to the next couple of days spending time with you guys and seeing your beautiful country. So, welcome to Pyongyang, lads. You, I promise you, you won't have a spare moment. <laughs> We're going to head towards the demilitarized zone, which separates North Korea from South Korea. A line was drawn at the DMZ, separating the country over 50 years ago. And this is a big reason why North Korea has maintained their isolation. When we had the meetings, our side took that place and the side that took this place. Yeah, this is where talks were held between North and South Korea that gave them a neutral place to have dialogue. And talk about a neutral place, like literally this side of the table is considered South Korea, and this is North Korea. We came in from the North Korean side, we're going to go out through the North Korean side. We're not exactly given a choice because there's a couple guards that are going to prevent anyone from exiting this end of things. So a matter of a foot, I'm on the south side, Scott is on the north side still, and only in this building are you allowed to do that. We traveled quite a distance to get right back to another portion of the demilitarized zone, but what we're about to see is a concrete wall which kind of marks the northern frontier of South Korea. <laughs> he said this area is the front of our country and uh, it is very the brave action and uh, very you know, the brave decision. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Either the brave or the stupid, I guess, to go on the front line like that. <laughs> really, we're doing a debrief here. And uh, thank you for coming here and on behalf of the, uh, to the front soldiers. 
Our country was, has been divided into north and south for 60 years. We suffered a lot from the division and the more because of their concrete wall. It is 240 kilometers long and it's 5 to 8 meters high. And inside the concrete wall, there is many the tanks and armored vehicles and guns. And they can come out at any time. We had a chance to meet up with the colonel and see things through his eyes, a person who's lived through it and whose job is to sit there and wait for a possible attack. And he hopes to see you again when the concrete walls are broken down. <laughs> so on the top of the heights, you can see the South Korean MP post. What we're looking at through these periscopes is a concrete wall that was erected in an attempt to make kind of a permanent divide between the north and the south of Korea. You can see with the view that they have from here why it really does feel like a permanent scar across one country. That's also the UN flag and the oh, South yeah. Korean flag as well. So just a reminder of which side you're on. You get a lot of feeling for how tense the situation still is, neither side really being satisfied, and of course they're not. They're still a country divided with two very different ideals. You start to see other perspectives, and I think that's a huge victory for us coming here to DPRK, is to see another side and try to understand in some small way where they're coming from. This huge building we're about to enter here is uh, the Korean War Museum, but people of DPRK refer to it as the Victorious Fatherland Liberation War Museum. Bit of a tongue twister for us, but that's what they refer to it as. We're probably going to see a very different perspective on the Korean War that we're used to hearing. This is a really unique chance for Westerners to be able to get the interpretation of the war as told by the people of DPRK. The planes you see over there was the first plane we used on the first stage of the Korean War. And we start to use this kind of plane from 1952. We don't often do museums, but this is one that's incredibly interesting to me, especially having relatives involved in this war, to come and see it from another perspective is hugely important. It just strikes me now, having already been to the DMZ and walking around that area, that this is a war museum that seems like it's reflecting all this history, but I mean, it's still really going on. It's really a war that never properly ended. It just puts into perspective as well of you know, how delicate the situation is and how delicate it's managed to stay for more than 50 years now. So weapons displayed here are all captured weapons from the enemies. This building was kind of designed with the mind of having this stuff here. They knew that they were going to build this museum, so they actually brought all this stuff in and then they built this building. So this stuff can never leave. It's stuck here forever. Mm, this one looks like a thunderbolt. 84. This one's a Corsair. You can tell by the swept wings. This one is the B-26 intruder. The F-86 Sabre that's down there, which I've never seen before. There's not much left to see, but these are shot down American planes. Seeing this does so much more than seeing some pictures, because I mean, this really just shows the damage that's done in war. And imagining a human being sitting in the cockpit of these vehicles, regardless of the fact that this is an American vehicle. I mean, obviously, Koreans lost their lives in planes very similar to these. You see the kind of damage that's done, and it's ridiculous. During the war, the Americans bombed 428,000 bombs to Pyongyang. Seoul was sort of raised to the ground here in, in Pyongyang. Three buildings were left standing. It gives you a scale of just how horrendous any other confrontation on this peninsula would be. There was a Pentagon estimate about 10 years ago that if war came, it would be a million dead uh, within 24 hours. We're on the upper level of the museum right now and there's a panorama of one of the major battles of the Korean War and seen as one of the big victories for the DPRK. I've never seen anything like this before. Uh, we're sitting on this revolving platform. As you go around, it shows you this giant painting 
for about 10 to 12 meters in front of us is a three-dimensional diorama. It's rocks and plants and things like that that seamlessly blend in to this mural. So this panorama was drawn by 40 Korean artists and it took one year and a half. This panorama shows the battle to liberate the desert city. Under the wise leadership of the great leader, President Kim Il-sung, we liberated the city, annihilating the American troops stations in desert city. This battle was the first battle for the Korean People's Army to fight against the Americans. The painting itself is beautiful and the artwork that's done is, is really to be admired here and praised and the kind of talent that they have to do this. But for me, as far as putting war into perspective, this doesn't do nearly what the tools of war that we saw in the basement do. It really helps me connect to the gravity of this war and all wars, really. Sometimes war can be glorified, and for some reason, we're just drawn to it. Maybe because it's so epic, maybe it's just because of how violent it is. It's such an evil part of life, but at the same time, there's something that just draws you in. I don't have any family members that have been lost to a war. My father, myself, and we've never had a fight in a war. I hope I never have to go through one, have to actually fight in one. I'm not saying I wouldn't, but at the same time, it's something I've never really had to deal with. We're dressing up this morning as we're visiting the mausoleum of Kim Il-sung, who passed away in 1994, and he's still regarded as the one and only president of the country. So to show respect, we're gonna dress up in our best, but this is gonna be definitely a first, isn't it, to wear a tie. We dressed up in uh, Jordan for the wedding. We got suits. That's true, we wore a tie um, for the wedding. I dressed up in India. Some things just never go to style. Some things were never in style. Behind us is actually kind of a common scene that we've been seeing so far is major intersections. Despite the fact that they actually have traffic lights, they use a woman in the middle who's directing traffic. They get through all weather conditions, you know, whether it's raining, snowing, in winter they've got big heavy coats on. And they're, so there they're, they're out times. here all year, all year long they're out here then. But it's very, very cold and it can be very cold in winter. And when it's very, very wet, which it can be, especially in June, um, actually that's when the traffic lights are used. But traffic lights just don't have the legs, I think. The that's, sorry, the bazaars, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, they don't have the bazaars. Obviously the content here is a bit limited. Everything is pertaining to the North Korean ideology, history, Kim Jong-il, Kim Il-sung. There's multimedia DVDs, personality of Kim Jong-il, Juche, maps of Pyongyang. Everything has been translated into English so that if you want to bring any of these things home with you, then this is the place to do it. Interesting to see a lot of books here of uh, the North Korean view of what's going on in South Korea. Obviously a very different view than what we're used to hearing. The Korean question, and U.S. forces in South Korea, backstage manipulation is disclosed, torture-ridden politics, eruption of wrath, letters from South Korea. Really interesting stuff to see their point of view and how they've spun things. I, I'm sure things have also been spun the other way and it's trying to find a middle ground. All the books here are for Korean domestic use, but then they also are produced in other languages. These are actually Korean books for Korean kids. And you're going to pick up a so comic book, are you? This is one, one of their heroes from previous times. Obviously a lot of fighting coming in somewhere along the line. I love it, it's sort of the emancipation of women, you know, the, often there's a pretty strong woman here going pyong <laughs> as she fires the bow and arrow. Classic. In fact, there's the bad imperialist. I think it's obviously it's American imperialist coming in doing untold bad. 
for no single. It's kind of the same images over and over and over again. Yeah. yeah, beautiful shots of landscape, the struggle, the war, where it just shows how since then they've been able to move forward. I guess that's propaganda, right? Basically, the art can be very revolutionary. I mean, here's a theme set during the Korean War. But here there's a propaganda piece, and it's a social one. This is basically teach kids to swim. And not all propaganda is revolutionary style. It can often be social messages, such as, you know, turn off the light, uh, give your seat to the elderly. Same thing that you and I have been shown throughout our lives, sure, but in a, sure. just in a different format. You're told something in the West, and there's nothing there to say that there's something different goes on in the country. Yes. They do produce masses of propaganda, which are there to inspire the people. But at the same time, there's, there's also the sort of relative freedom of just painting what goes. This is the cemetery of the martyrs who fell during the revolution. And we're not the only ones here. There's a lot of people that have come to give thanks and remember all the fallen soldiers. One thing that struck me since being in DPRK is the devotion that the people have to revere somebody even after death as so important to the greater good of North Korea. That says a lot. The bus that we're going to pay tribute to this is Kim Jong-suk, who's the wife of Kim Il-sung and the mother of Kim Jong-il, who was also shown as being part of the revolution. You can see uh, all the soldiers coming up to show respect. And it looks like there's a few hundred of them. It makes me feel a little uncomfortable because we're not really supposed to be filming anything military. Um, maybe it's a good time to take a lunch break then, you know? Just <laughs> go to commercial. <laughs> We've arrived at the mausoleum of Kim Il-sung. We'll see information about him. Um, we will see him lying in state. We'll also see some awards and gifts that he's been presented from not only this country, but other countries as well. And we're gonna go in, but this is as far as the camera's allowed to go. It's an extremely special place to the Korean people, a very revered place for them. So the only thing we can really get is just the actual building itself. Anything yeah. inside the building is pretty much yeah, it's off, off limits. Off record, yeah. Wow. The funny thing for me is seeing how delicate a situation having the camera is here. This is arguably under more control than even the DMZ. This shines a real light on just how important Kim Il-sung is to every part of this country because of the Juche ideology that he developed, which is basically a mix of socialism, Marxist, Leninist philosophy. It was very, very powerful. And you walk through and see uh, a lot of his medals. And as soon as you walk in the center is the great leader himself lying underneath this red blanket. We could sit here all day explaining what we saw. And yeah, we can only tell you so much. But if you really want to understand what this place is about, you have to come here. Yeah, it's closed off from the outside world, but because it's been closed off, for once I've got the chance to come in and have a travel experience like this one before it's too late. It still comes down to a respect for a culture that is not mine. This country preserved its culture better than anywhere else I've ever seen before. I didn't know this existed, but it's called a barrage. It separates the ocean from fresh water. Right here, I have ocean on me. And the other side of me is fresh water. This is the first time I've ever seen anything like that. I didn't even know a barrage existed until like five minutes ago when I was told what it was about. I was like, Bar barrage, barrage, what the hell is a barrage? The old monument there tells about the immortal exploits of President Kim Il-sung and leader Kim Jong-il of the DPRK and difficult they had to control the wild sea with a strong tidal current. Their indomitable spirit of self-sacrifice displayed for the prosperity of the nation can be traced. This is quite a bumpy road, and <laughs> I've had it. I think this is it, you can leave me here. It's all too much for a boy. It'd be great if Koreans weren't taking photos of me every two minutes. We're on the west coast right now. This is where the Taedong River meets the West Sea. They built this barrage, which is huge. It's about eight kilometers long. 
for me, it's just cool to be on the coast and have a look out at the ocean and enjoy the day a little bit, get some fresh air, stretch. We watched a little film about the barrage, got some information about another very big aspect of the country that they're proud of. In 1967, there was an extremely bad flood in Pyongyang, and so in order to stop the city from flooding, they decided to control the river. But by bringing the barrage down this far, they also meant they could do sort of look like a bit of land reclamation. And of course, fresh water meant that you got a lot better freshwater fishes. It's uh, quite a good idea. The barrage is nice too. It is a big accomplishment, don't get me wrong, but um, the natural scenery is a bit more pleasing for me. So how, okay, so, how yeah, if you move or if I fall on you or you've touched me, you lose. So that's, ah, one nil to me. <laughs> Two nil to me. It's, it's all technique, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's a cult. <laughs> Three nil to me. <laughs> then there's the Korean one. This is Korean. We have to attach that to four together. Now push or the pull. Never, you don't have to uh, do a separate. <laughs> oh, okay. You're up. I don't do that bloody well. I can't do this. So is there, does anybody say go? Go. <laughs> you move first. You, you can't to... use that hand. You can't just go like that. <laughs> what? Go under this the smack. There you <laughs> go, I got you again. Okay, third, you <laughs> get. Oh, well, I'm up two now. Round. Third round. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> you just let go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we just hope you show our culture is as rich and rewarding as yours. Beautiful. Since we've learned so much about the barrage, I think it's safe to say it's uh, it's time to go. So after this display of manhood, she's uh, she hasn't really decided any of us are fit for marriage. <laughs> I get the girl! I get the girl! Hey, they always like the weak ones. Oh, they so? <laughs> Never mind. It's okay. I get the girl. Oh, thank you. Would I so? We're spending the night out of the city, which is nice to get out of Pyongyang for a night and we're at a spa, cottage, sort of crossover thing. This is pretty sweet. They have a um, natural hot spring spa here. Meet yourself as well. Thank you, yeah. Where, where is, the, sp is the, the spa? We all have our own spa? Oh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no way we're getting in this thing. <laughs> Me and you are not doing this. No, at the same time. That's what I thought it was going to happen. I thought we're all gonna get like every the whole group of us are gonna get in there. I didn't bring my own little bubble bath to do this. Go on, have a look inside. <laughs> While we're out here on the coast, we're having a special treat right in front of the house that we're staying in. Since we're on the coast, we're having some seafood. They've dug up some clams, so we've got this huge pile of clams that we need to cook up, but the driver has decided to take the chef hat for tonight, and he's cooking it up his specialty style with, uh, with petroleum. <laughs> they were talking about having a barbecue. I didn't expect that they were just gonna drizzle gasoline and light it on fire on top of a bunch of clams on the ground. I'll try it. Oh, I think I'll just get some gas. That's the best part. I can never smell the gasoline. <laughs> it's smell like a mechanic. Yeah. Thank right. you. Woo! This clam has a season of poison. It's so uh, June and August. Oh, when they have uh, babies and they are inside, their flesh is, has two the poisons. So when the people eat that, eat that at that period, everybody was killed. No. Really, a serious. Oh, great. And we're in September now. We're about a couple of weeks off. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really. Thanks. The possibility of these plants being poisonous is one thing. 
being cooked in gasoline is another. Sounds like this, I'm glad I don't eat seafood. I'm okay. Yeah. Only thing is. Yeah, okay. ah. <laughs> Here we go, for you, mate. This is where when you drop the gun, come around and drops dead within about five seconds. We're on the massive highway that uh, connects the coast to Pyongyang. We're not allowed to do a lot of things that we normally would. I mean, we're not allowed to film out of the windows. There's a lot of military personnel and a lot of military facilities. They're very protective of us catching any of that on camera by accident. There's just so much of it, it's hard to avoid. And it can be frustrating, especially for us, especially for Andre, to be able to try to do this process the way we normally do it. And you just can't do that here. Not exactly sure what we're going to be up to today, but I guess that's part of the fun of it. It's weird to not have to plan ahead. This is kind of nice. It's almost like a vacation from what I'm used to, just being able to sit back and let the bus take me wherever it's going. It's quite a group. It certainly is. They'd probably come out from Pyongyang then for the day to... Not sure. I mean, no, I think these kids come from further afield. Oh, yeah? Well, obviously, this is where they all come from. This, this mountain is obviously producing thousands of children. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> First stop of the day, we're actually back towards Pyongyang right now, but there's a, quite a large hill, almost what I would call a small mountain, and we're going to hike up it. It's called Dragon Mountain. Story goes that in order to send a message from the sea to heaven, they sent a dragon with the message. And it came here, loved the view so much it stayed, turned to stone.